Would you please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to uh, just simply read verses 13 through 16 to uh, make one point at the outset that we're going to see again as we uh, go through this, this particular section. I should tell you up front that this area that Edwards is dealing with here is going to be a little bit more than we can cover this evening, even though I've trimmed it down considerably. Uh, we'd probably easily be in it for an hour to try to cover everything, so I'm just going to split it up between this week and next week. But again, Edwards is going to take us more deeply into the subject of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in this case, what his particular work is in the, uh, in the covenant of grace and why it is given to him to do that particular work. Now, uh, I'd like to begin by reading Galatians 5, 13 through 16, but again, recognizing that this is a topical study. We're not really going to uh, spend a lot of time with this text. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 13, Paul writes, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, Edwards, as I mentioned, is going to be drawing our attention to the fact that, that the Holy Spirit and divine love are basically interchangeable terms. And notice that uh, Paul says to them that if they, through love, serve one another, then they will be able to overcome the flesh. And he says the same thing in verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Just pointing out to us the fact that walking by love and walking by the Spirit are the same thing because the Spirit is the one who produces this love. Well, let's go ahead and look at what he has to tell us this evening. But first, let's review. We have seen something, uh, well, we have seen certain things Edwards has pointed out so far. I'll briefly review them. First of all, Believers have something unbelievers do not have, the Spirit of God. Unbelievers have something of the work of the Spirit in their hearts, something of His common work. They have conviction of sin. They have what we might call the common illumination of the Spirit, which we see in Hebrews chapter 6, that they have tasted of the Word of God. There is some way or some common way in which the Spirit of God may work within the hearts of, of even the unregenerate to convict them of sin and to reveal certain things to them, at least truth at some level. But only believers have the saving work of the Holy Spirit, which is entirely different and something the unbeliever has nothing of. Now we've also seen that the saving work of the Spirit is only one principle in the soul, one divine principle and not many. As Edwards pointed out, that uh, when Jesus talks about if we believe in him, we'll have within our souls a well of water springing up to eternal life, that there's really only one spring that the Spirit of God places within us. There is only one seed of God that causes us to walk in righteousness. It's one principle. And that principle, he told us, is love, divine love, towards God. All that is necessary to fulfill within us the blessings of the covenant of grace, or I should say the new covenant, since all these covenants are different administrations, is the impartation of this divine love, because love is the fulfillment of the commandments. And we've also seen that this saving work that the Spirit does within the soul of believers is something that is done immediately, something he does directly, not something he does in stages, but something that he works, we might say, directly within the soul, and not through means. And the scripture calls this work spiritual, which means, as Edward sees it, that it in some way participates in the nature of the Spirit of God in a way that his common work doesn't. Now, hopefully that will be more clear as we, or clear as we uh, look at what he has to say this evening. This evening, Edwards is going to probe a little bit more deeply into that last um, subject, the idea of saving grace being spiritual. Saving grace in some way participating in the nature of the Holy Spirit in a way that his common work does not. 
Now he says, granted that saving grace in some way participates in the nature of the Spirit, and I'm going to quote Edwards here, the question he asks is, how does saving grace partake of the nature of that Spirit that it is from, so as to be called on that account spiritual, thus essentially distinguishing it from all other effects of the Spirit? Edwards uh, has a way of saying things. All of these words are, are actually necessary to convey what he has to say, but we're going to summarize it and just say, how does saving grace differ from the other things that the Spirit of God does? Now, Edwards will answer this question by showing us that this saving grace, which is a principle of divine love, as we've already seen, though it isn't unique to the Spirit as a member of the Godhead, because God himself is characterized by love, is still something that is peculiar to his nature, or peculiarly his nature. And that, that's something that's difficult to understand because really, well, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later. Let me just mention this at the outset, that all of the attributes that God has, all the persons of the Godhead share in those attributes. So if God is love, all three of them are love. If God is infinite, they're all infinite. If God is independent, they're all independent, so forth. If they're all infinitely wise, or if God is infinitely wise, they all are. But yet, the spirit of, or the scriptures do basically um, set, or, or how do I say, well, they, they characterize the spirit as love more than the other members of the Godhead. So that's something that he wants to, to bring out. And of course, in explaining this, Edwards is also going to take us into an examination of the nature of the Trinity, uh, of those things that distinguish the different persons within the Godhead. And perhaps more deeply than any other theologian has uh, attempted to do. And, and really, when you, if you can get an, or a grasp of everything that he has to say about the Spirit, it, it really begins to make sense uh, on his explanation of what we would call the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, just briefly again, the, uh, uh, the different members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are called by those names because there is something that distinguishes them from one another. They're not the same person. They're three individual persons, but they are different in, in at least some ways. The Father is the Father of the Son. The Son is the Son of the Father. Okay, And the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, that's historically how the relationship has been explained between the three members of the Godhead. Edwards is going to take us a little bit deeper to uh, show us uh, how these things come about, anyway, at least uh, as much as we can. But he would say, in a way that's inconceivable, infinitely inconceivable, <laughs> but at least we know something of it, okay. All right, so from these things, let's consider three things. First of all, there is something unique about saving grace. And it, what it, what's unique about it is it participates in something distinctive to the Spirit of God. Secondly, he's going to show us what that peculiar characteristic of the Spirit is. I think you should know what that is by now, love. Okay. And thirdly, how this is best understood by the relationship the Spirit has with the Father and the Son. So that's a tall order. Let's uh, get into it. First of all, Let's consider there is something unique about saving grace. It, it participates in something that is peculiar to the Spirit. Now here's, here's where we see Edwards at work again as a logician. Let me give you a um, slightly extended quote of Edwards and then we'll try to understand what he says here. He writes, quote, Every effect has in some respect or another the nature of its cause. And the common convictions and illuminations that natural men have are in some respects of the nature of the Spirit of God. For there is light and understanding and conviction of truth in these common illuminations, and so they are of the nature of the Spirit of God. That is, a discerning spirit and a spirit of truth. But yet saving grace, by its being called spiritual, as though it were thereby distinguished from all other gifts of the Spirit, seems to partake of the nature of the Spirit of God in some very peculiar manner. Now let's think about this for a minute. First of all, he says, every effect has something of the nature of its cause in it. So whatever the Spirit of God does, it's going to uh, 
produce with, within the, the, let's say, the uh, recipient of that effect, okay, something that has to do with his nature. Uh, some examples of this, let's say, of, of the, uh, the effects having something to the nature of, of the cause in them. Okay, what does water do when you apply it to something? It makes it wet, doesn't it? It, it, it imparts something of its nature to that thing. Fire heats things up, doesn't it? It imparts warmth to it, sometimes even causes them to, to burn or combust. Uh, if you exert a force on an object in a straight line, it causes that object to go in a straight line until other forces, of course, overcome it and slow it down. Gravity, of course, uh, is, is a, I guess you might say, a downward force, at least it is from our perspective here. And when it imparts its force on other things, it causes them to move downward as well. These effects have something of the nature of, the, of their cause within them. And in the same way, everything the Spirit of God does has something of His nature in it. He is the Spirit of holiness, of what is good and right. So His work on the hearts even of unconverted men will be to convict them of holiness. You see that? His nature is holy and He convinces men that they're doing things that are wrong. It's contrary to holiness. Okay? He is the Spirit of truth. And so His work on the minds of men will be to convince them of the truth even of unconverted men. Again, Hebrews chapter 6, where unconverted men, it talks about those who have been made partakers of the Spirit of God and tasted of the powers of the age to come and so forth, all these different things they experience, and yet they fall away and can't be renewed again to repentance. It's talking about those who were never converted, but yet have some of the common operation of the Spirit, and those things that He does within them has something to do with His own nature. Okay? the effect will have something of the nature of the cause in it. But yet, he says, there is something special about saving grace. It partakes of the nature of the Spirit in a very peculiar way. But then he asks, what is that which is peculiar or special about it? Now, to answer the question, he says there's two things we must do. First of all, we need to remember what the nature of saving grace is that we've already seen. And that is that it is one principle of divine love. Just one principle, not many, not many fountains and so forth, not many different fruits and so forth, but one fruit that expresses itself in many different ways, and that is divine love. And then he says we need to understand what the Scripture tells us is the special nature of the Spirit, how He is characterized in Scripture. Now, having shown us the first, he moves on to the second, which is to show us how Scripture characterizes the Spirit. So let's consider that for a moment. First of all, he reminds us, and I'm not sure exactly why he does this, but maybe it's just to remind us that, that the Godhead is composed of more than one person and they all share the same attributes. First of all, he says, Scripture tells us that the Spirit is a divine person, not an impersonal force as Jehovah's Witnesses may believe or you know, other spurious groups. We really don't concerned about what they might think about it, but there are people who misunderstand who the Spirit of God is. And even within the church, I think we've seen, uh, if you haven't run into somebody like this, surely you will before you leave this world, who aren't fully convinced the Spirit of God is a person. But he reminds us that the Spirit of God is spoken of as a person, does things that only a person can do, reacts as a person does in different situations, and has all the attributes of personality, of which the ones I've already mentioned are part. Even though he isn't often referred to in Scripture by personal pronouns, you've probably heard that before, uh, that if you were to look at those personal pronouns, they're basically, not always, but most, most often in, in the neuter form. Okay? In, in Greek, like we have in English, you have masculine, feminine, and neuter. And neuter is usually used to refer to, to inanimate objects or things that you know don't have that aren't alive. Okay. Uh, in Greek, that isn't necessarily the case. In Greek, the pronoun has to agree with the noun in its gender. And it just so happens the word spirit in Greek is neuter, which is why the pronouns that refer to it are neuter. But that doesn't mean the spirit is in the person. However, we do have examples in Scripture where the spirit is called by masculine pronouns, and they don't agree with the word in the Greek, because the author is, is showing us specifically that the Spirit of God is a person. So even though he isn't often referred to in the Scripture by personal pronouns, clearly he is a person. 
There is one God, but this one God is three persons. Now, secondly, he says, each of the three persons of the Godhead share the same attributes, as I've already mentioned. Uh, reminding ourselves from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question four, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. These things are equally true of all members of the Godhead. They all possess that infinite spirit that has these attributes, and so each of them possessing the whole of this infinite spirit possesses all of these attributes. I hope that's not too lofty for us to understand. Whatever is true of this infinite spirit we call God is equally true of all three members of the Godhead. Now Edwards wants us to remember that so that we don't end up seeing as, as the scripture characterizes specifically one member of the Godhead with one characteristic or another that it doesn't mean if he says for instance that the spirit is love that the father is not love or that the, the son is not love. It's not as though the Spirit is only love and the, you know, these others don't, or that the, the Son of God is only the wisdom or the logos of God. They, they all possess these attributes, but the Scripture does, thirdly, single them out and characterize them by these specific attributes. And the Spirit is singled out as being characterized by love. Now again, to show us that this is true of the whole Godhead, he gives us a couple of verses to think about. 1 John 4, 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And what that means is that the whole Godhead is characterized by love, this divine love. 1 John 4, 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Okay, so again, you have explicitly, as you can hope to see in Scripture, God is love. That is true of the whole Godhead and not just of the Spirit. However, the Scripture does appear to single out this attribute, particularly in the Spirit of God. Verses 12 and 13 of the same chapter. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Notice the idea, if we have love dwelling in us, then God dwells in us. And this love is God's spirit dwelling in us. Now this shouldn't surprise us, he says, since the scripture teaches us that the way that God dwells in us is by his Holy Spirit. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. John is simply teaching the same thing here. Again, in our text that we looked at this evening, Galatians 5, verses 13 through 16, let me remind you again of what it says. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We are told in verses 13 through 15 that if we walk in love, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And we're told in verse 6 that our scene is We shouldn't think it's strange that Scripture would single out this particular attribute. And truth 